Thank you for watching CCG7's China and Globalization Forum special program, China-U.S. Think Tank Online Dialogue, Balancing Competition and Cooperation Amid Global Challenges. What's Next for U.S.-China Relations, presented by the Center for China and Globalization and the Asia Foundation. This special forum feature webinar is hosted by Dr. Wang Huiyao, President of the Center for China and Globalization. Dr. Wang, please. Thank you. Uh, good evening and uh, good morning, uh, depending where you are, and also good afternoon. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are very honored and pleased to have uh, to host this uh, CCG China US Think Tank Dialogue, which is a part of our ongoing seventh annual China and Globalization Forum. And this dialogue was co-organized, is co-organized with the uh, Asia Foundation. So CCG China and Globalization Forum is CCG a flagship annual forum that we hold uh, uh, once every year. And this year, uh, actually, we have a, a draw a very large uh, 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 attendance. And uh, uh, actually, since uh, uh, we had this in 2015, this is probably one of the largest. It has been hosted uh, uh, in conjunction with our uh, CCG Council members. Also, we bring together uh, most prominent uh, 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 business leaders, uh, uh, government officials, academia, and also uh, 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 non-government sector as well. I mean, during the last, uh, actually, uh, uh, two days, we had uh, four to 500 participants attending our conference. And uh, now we are, we are getting into the uh, webinar part of our conference, uh, which is also open to our, all participants and also uh, can be watched online. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, which is going on, and uh, now China also discovered new cases. So how can we really cope with that is, uh, is one of the actual issues we talked about. And uh, we had also discussed about global economy, trade, uh, mobility of the, of the people, uh, China and European uh, uh, economic cooperation, uh, global cooperation and China's new development plan, and of course, uh, uh, a China's new international communication uh, narrative as well. So on the U.S. part, we are actually having uh, uh, three webinars uh, uh, that uh, as our uh, uh, China-U.S. Uh, part of the of the dialogue. And tonight is actually the the feature webinar of uh, uh, China-U.S. think tank dialogue, which we joined uh, with very four distinguished uh, uh, speakers. Uh, so today's dialogue actually features the theme of balancing competition and cooperation amongst the global challenges. What's next for the U.S.-China relations? As we all know, last, last week, the U.S. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Wendy Sherman, just concluded her visit, first visit uh, for the Biden administration of officials to China, and a new Chinese ambassador, uh, Qin Gang, uh, just arrived in Washington this week. So we have a lot of uh, uh, questions and a lot of uh, uh, curiosity and uh, for how U.S. and China can maintain. It's a moment of a diplomatic dialogue, but also we want to hear the views from our uh, speakers today, uh, which from uh, Adam Posen, uh, uh, Steve Roy, uh, John Fountain, and also uh, Minister Zhu, Zhu Guangyao. But let me uh, quickly introduce our, our guest today. Uh, uh, I, I do this as an alphabetical order. Uh, Adam uh, Posen has been the president of the Peterson Institute of Economic, International Eco Economics since 2013. I mean, the, the Peterson Institute is well known, is an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization dedicated to strengthening prosperity and human welfare in a global economy through expert analysis and practical policy solutions. Uh, for his career, Adam has contributed to research and public policy regarding monetary and fiscal policies in the G20, the challenge of European integration, this is adoption of the EU, EU China-US economic relation, which is a very active uh, uh, Peterson Institute, and develop new approaches for financial recovery and stability. During his uh, presidency, the Peterson Institute has won global recognition as the leading independent think tank in international economics. And of course, we have our old friend, uh, uh, 
uh, Ambassador Stephen Roy, and uh, he's the Asia Foundation's trustee emeritus and also a former U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, Asia Foundation is a nonprofit international development organization committed to improving the lives across a dynamic and developing Asia. Ambassador Roy is a, is a fluent Chinese uh, speaker. Actually, he's, he was born in China and he actually spent time in, in, in Chengdu and, and uh, has a lot of good fond memories there. Uh, and he spent much of his career in East Asia and uh, has a three time ambassador serving as US envoy to Singapore and to uh, People's Republic of China, 1991 to 1995, and also Indonesia. And uh, in 1996, he was promoted to the rank of a Korea ambassador, the highest rank in the United States Foreign Service. Also now, uh, Ambassador Rowe is the founding director, Emeritus, and also distinguished scholar at the Wilson Center Kissinger Institute on China and the United States, and the trustee of a Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. As we all know that uh, this year also marks the 50th anniversary of uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger's secret visit to China. So, so it will be probably one of our uh, topic tonight as well. And of course, we have, uh, 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 we have a Mr. John Thornton, is the chair emeritus and of the Booking Institution and co-chair of Asia Society. So we know that Booking Institution and Asia Society are two very prominent uh, think tanks and uh, in the United States that has really has a uh, big influence, uh, not only in the US, but also uh, in the world and also in China as well. So uh, that uh, uh, John is actually uh, chair of both organizations, uh, uh, speaks volumes. He's also the executive chairman of the Barry Gold and chairman of the Pine Bridge Investments. And of course, uh, 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 on top of that, uh, John is also a professor and the director of a global leadership program at the Tsinghua University School of Economic Management in Beijing. Uh, John retired in 2003 as the president and a member of the board of the Goldman Sachs Group. So has a very, uh, very long, uh, rich uh, career. Uh, in 2007, Institution Investor Magazine named uh, Mr. Santan as one of the 14 individuals who have the greatest influence in shaping global financial markets over the previous 40 years. And he's was, he was also a recipient of, in 2008 of the Friendship Award of the People's Republic of China, which is the highest honor of, according to the non-Chinese citizen. And also Chinese government also named him as one of the 15 foreign experts who has made most significant contribution to China's development over the previous three decades. So a very, very uh, uh, notable achievement. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, my friend, also uh, my colleagues, uh, at uh, uh, State Council, uh, Minister Zhu Guangyao. And uh, Minister Zhu Guangyao is a CCG advisor and a former Vice Minister of Finance of China from 2010 to 2018. Uh, as a Vice Minister of Finance, Minister Zhu oversaw the Customer Tariff Department as well as coordinating economic track of the China-US strategic and economic dialogue and also the financial Shepherd of the G20 for the ministry. I mean, he joined the Minister of Finance in 1985 and served in various positions with the ministry, also included as a senior advisor, alternate executive director, and direct exec director of the China to the World Bank uh, in, in two occasions. So, uh, so actually, we are very pleased to be joined by uh, 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 Minister Zhu as well. Uh, myself, I'm the uh, uh, I'm the founder and president of Center for China and Globalization, and also uh, one of the uh, leading Chinese think tank, and also we are one of the top uh, 100 think tanks ranked by the University of Pennsylvania. And Minister Zhu is also uh, our advisor for the think tank. So this is a think tank dialogue uh, we are between the Chinese and US uh, 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 think tanks. So I'm very pleased to, uh, to uh, be the host of this dialogue tonight. I would like to actually start with, uh, with Adam. I mean, you are, you are actually very uh, knowledgeable. You've been traveling to China, and I, I see that you have uh, made a lot of uh, uh, remarks about uh, China, US, how it should collaborate, how, how it should improve, or how can, uh, you know, including the, 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 the uh, CPTPP and also a lot of trade issues. Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll start with you and uh, 
in 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 your in your in your uh, you know in your position as the think tank. Uh, what is the what is the uh, thinking of the U.S. economy, Chinese economy, and how we get out of this <laughs> pandemic? Uh, how about the U.S.-China relations? Uh, what are the uh, you know trade, uh, which is uh, one of the theme of our uh, conference today? People view that as the biggest uh, uh, promoter for for the global uh, future development, as the World Bank uh, uh, chief uh, he said here in our conference today. So, what do you think? I mean, as you are very uh, Savvy in the in this subject. Uh, Adam, your floor, much. please. Thank you very much, President Wang, for including me on this distinguished panel, and congratulations to your center for continuing to lead substantive dialogue in China and globally. Obviously, this is a major conference. Um, I think the big message of what the questions you raise is, is really to say that the US-China conflict and frictions are not about economics, even though they currently take place in economics. And this has been a major preoccupation under Trump and again under Biden. And as I argued in my recent article in Foreign Affairs on the price of nostalgia, it mostly is being driven by politics in both China and the US where they, Basically, the males working in industry in non-urban centers are blackmailing the rest of society. Um, and we see this with the state-owned enterprises in China. We see this with the trade bailouts of the heavy industry in the US. And in both countries, those parts of the economy are a shrinking part of the economy and a shrinking even faster part of employment. Um, they also are industries that are, of course, toxic to our environment as well as to our politics. And so what we are seeing is both the U.S., American, and Chinese peoples are being ill-served by the trade conflict. And it's not about economics. Um, and so what we've seen under the Biden administration and in response in part and in part of its own initiative from the Xi government is a shift now from trade to worrying about technology. Uh, obviously there have been frictions for many years. Uh, the others on this panel have been dealing with them directly for even longer than I have um, over issues of intellectual property, over issues of government subsidies. But for the most part, these have not been issues that should have imperiled the broader relationship on any economic basis. What has escalated it now is the sense in the US and China that each is posing a genuine threat in a geopolitical sense, and in a sense to their system or their legitimacy. And this is a reality among the official class in both Washington and Beijing. There's some good reason for it. It's mostly exaggerated. Um, and it colors, of course, every interaction. And so the question is, what can we do from here? Um, let me make three very brief points so you can get to the others on the, on the panel. First, remember that both the US and China have led the world in recovery from the COVID crisis and are both growing well above trend growth rates right now by a large margin. So this is not a question of either is depriving the other of economic recovery. So there is no conflict over currency right now. There is no issue of Chinese surpluses coming at US expense. There is no issue of financial instability being promoted from one to the other or back and forth. So we have to focus on the non-economic issues, which is funny for an economist like me to say. The second point is, as you've indicated in your setup for this discussion, President Wang and others I know have spoken about, it, even though it's boring, it has to be said. The biggest opportunity for collaboration between China and the US is on climate change issues. That was the case when President Obama was here, when our friend Minister Zhu was very active in the G7 and the G20. 
and that remains the best place for us to collaborate at this time. And third, since you were wise enough uh, and generous enough to convene a group of think tankers, I just want to say that we, like CCG, Peterson Institute, Brookings, the Kissinger Center, the ministry's own think tank, Ministry of Finance own think tank, we all have a role in continuing to say that we should not be afraid of honest dialogue among experts. We have a common enemy in conspiracy theories and disinformation. And we think tanks should be binding, bounding ourselves together to emphasize the possibility of objective analysis and honest, frank talk. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Adam, for your, for your great uh, opening, uh, opening remark. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, you, I agree with you that it uh, seems that non-economic non issue that really <laughs> deterred us from uh, talking uh, of the real substance and, and where at time we need to collaborate on pandemic fighting, climate change, and, and many other things. Uh, uh, so this is really needed, a frank dialogue between the two, uh, two sides think tanks. So you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, perhaps I, I can also let the uh, uh, Ambassador Rod to give some opening remark as well. I mean, uh, you are a seasoned diplomat. I mean, you also know China since you were <laughs> a child. Uh, you lived through, uh, 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 you know, many, many uh, uh, years of uh, uh, turmoil and, and uh, all those uh, all the, all the times. And uh, I remember visiting you uh, in your office when I was a, 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 a visiting fellow at Brookings. Uh, in 2010, I mean, you, you showed me <laughs> all those good, uh, uh, you know, photos and things like that. So, so, so I, I would like to really ask, you know, you witnessed so many things uh, in China. So now we have a, a, a ambassador, uh, a, a new Chinese ambassador to go to the U.S. We don't know why is the U.S. ambassador to China, but, but we had a visit of uh, 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 Deputy Secretary uh, uh, Randy Sherman. So. What's your take on the, on the Sino-U.S. relation, past, present, and future? Because you were also uh, the founding director of a Kissinger Institute. And this year is uh, 50 years of uh, Kissinger's second visit to China. We had just uh, uh, the other day on the uh, 11th of, uh, of July, we had a live dialogue to, uh, uh, to commemorate uh, his uh, historic visit. Uh, we had a dialogue with uh, uh, Dr. Kissinger that day. and uh, so. So, so you must uh, uh, have a lot of uh, uh, feelings on that uh, since you, 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 your, your institute at Wilson Center is named after him. And of course, this year is also China joined the UN for the 50 years, China joined WTO for, for 20 years, China joined APAC for 30 years, and it's the Cold War ending 30 years. So a lot of it's going on past, present, future. So as a senior, as, as, as seasoned as you, I mean, you're, uh, uh, voice is really, uh, thinking is really uh, much uh, noticed here. So, uh, Ambassador Roy, your turn, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang, and good evening to all of you who are in China. When President Trump lost the November 2020 presidential elections in the United States, some people hoped that President Biden would adopt a less confrontational approach to relations with China. They have been disappointed. Early steps by the new American administration toward China seem to be a continuation of President Trump's hardline policies. Shortly after the administration took office, the new Secretary of State echoed the charge of his predecessor that China was engaged in genocide against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. The tariff barriers on bilateral trade have been left in place. Senior officials in the Biden administration bluntly stated that the U.S. engagement strategy toward China had failed and that competition is now the principal driver in the bilateral relationship. For much of the last 50 years, the United States was confident that China's growing wealth and power did not threaten United States vital interests and that differences could be managed by diplomacy and engagement. That is no longer the case. And the question is, why? A starting point to understanding what has happened is to recognize 
that the United States and China are both in the midst of fundamental transitions that affect their respective places in the world. The United States is seeking to adjust to an international situation in which it is no longer the sole superpower. This is not so much because of a decline in power, but because other countries have risen to major power status. And China, of course, is the first and foremost example of that. A new multipolar world is emerging. Not surprisingly, the United States is reluctant to give up the dominant position that it has occupied since the end of the Cold War and to accept the adjustments that it must make in order to establish a new equilibrium. At the same time, there is no question that the social and, politi and political polarization that has been a prominent feature of the US domestic scene over the last half decade has damaged the international image of the United States and the perception of its reliability as a great power. China in turn, in a remarkably short period of time, has regained the wealth and military strength that are the attributes of major powers. This has altered the psychology of the Chinese people. This is what Zheng Bijian didn't take into account when he came up with the concept of peaceful rise. The Chinese people now are demanding a more muscular foreign policy consistent with China's growing power. And it has changed China's behavior patterns, which have become more assertive. As a result, regional countries, including the United States, find China's assurances less and less credible that it will rise peacefully and never bully its neighbors. These are two of the key background factors that have influenced the sharp plunge in the bilateral US-China relationship to the lowest depths in half a century. This has created a dangerous situation where missteps by either side or by both could plunge the world into an unprecedented crisis. I use the term unprecedented because China and the United States are both major nuclear powers and confrontations between them are particularly dangerous. Repair work by both sides is vitally necessary. Fortunately, despite some superficial similarities, the Biden administration is fundamentally different from its predecessor. President Biden has more foreign policy and national security experience than any American president since the first President Bush 30 years ago. In contrast to the Trump administration, President Biden has appointed capable and experienced officials as Secretary of State and national security advisor. These are officials who could sit down without talking points and talk for hours with Chinese counterparts about any issue in the world. And this was totally missing in the last administration. The Biden administration is moving carefully to iron out internal differences and adopt sustainable policies that will not simply reflect the whims of the moment. Of particular importance for US-China relations, the administration has reaffirmed that it will adhere to a one-China policy and that it does not support independence for Taiwan. It is also seeking a pattern of regular consultations between Beijing and Washington. The recent consultations between US Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman and State Counselor Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Vice Minister Xia Feng were surrounded by a barrage of charges by each side against the other. However, if one reads carefully the public reports regarding the consultations, it is evident that there were constructive elements. According to the Chinese account of the meeting, Deputy Secretary Sherman called the US-China relationship the most important bilateral relationship in the world, noted the many times the two sides have had contact with each other since President Biden was sworn in, expressed US willingness to have open and candid contacts and dialogues with China, declared the United States hopes that two countries can coexist peacefully, said the United States has no intention of restricting China's development, does not want to contain China and would like to see China develop further. Noted the two sides can engage in healthy competition, 
cooperate on climate change, drug control, and international and regional hotspots, and strengthen crisis management cap capacity and avoid conflicts. American accounts of the meeting, uh, the meetings she had, are consistent with the above statements. These are encouraging words that you would not have heard from the previous administration, but the reality is less positive. President Biden needs congressional support for his domestic programs and congressional attitudes toward China are hostile. Changing these attitudes will be difficult, but not impossible. A hardline American approach to China does not mesh well with the interests of US allies and friends in East Asia who do not wish to see the region polarized. In other words, as the United States tries to work with our friends and allies, it will discover that they do not support a hard line approach to China. And I think that will have an impact over time. But as a first step, it would be useful for both China and the United States to tone down their rhetoric toward each other. Governments have the responsibility not only to formulate wise foreign policies, but to talk in ways that develop public support for those policies. And we are not doing that. We are talking publicly in ways that undermine the wise policies that we should be pursuing. And so as a starter, let's get our rhetoric under control. And I hope that we'll have some chance to exchange views about other steps that could be taken. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Rao. Uh, yeah, you have made, uh, the, I think, very, uh, a good uh, opening remark. This is really, I uh, 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 agree, you know, deep concern <laughs> on both sides. I mean, that, uh, we, we seem to, uh, 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 you know, really call, argue, and yell, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, I, I agree that uh, Trump has done uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, probably uh, damage to the, uh, the existing relations. But of course, there's, there's a lot of problems also, but, but, but I've the problem is that uh, I think uh, in the Trump administration, the, 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 the core team he used is not that really, uh, as you said, uh, savvy on China. I mean, I had a debate, a monk debate with, uh, with uh, uh, H.R. McMaster. I mean, he's a, a, a journal <laughs> fighting in Iraq and, and maybe not really that knowledge on China. We had Michael Pillsbury, <laughs> we talked about, but he's also more on the, on the military front. So, so we are actually uh, really lacking the, uh, a great, uh, uh, you know, Chinese uh, uh, China hand in the in the in the Trump administration, but but we see that absolutely you're right. I mean, the Biden administration, we we see Biden has uh, has a long uh, knowledge of foreign policy, as you said. He's uh, uh, he has met President Xi, uh, spent more time than any other uh, leaders in the world, and uh, so so uh, he actually called the Chinese people on the eve of Chinese New Year, say Happy New Year to President Xi, and he actually stopped the use of. Uh, 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 referring wives to China wives, he issued some kind of exact order on that. So, so all those good, I think, has been noticed. But, but somehow lately, we 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 see there was there's some uh, acceleration uh, of of changes, maybe from Chinese point of view, because we had the uh, 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 you know the G7 summit. Uh, you know, there's also a schedule on China. And there's a, a, a NATO summit. There's a U.S. EU summit. There's a EU <laughs> U.S. Russian summit. You know, so. So, so now I'm glad that uh, uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Sherman visited China. So we hope that we're going to start a new, uh, new uh, dialogue. Uh, you're right. I think the, the dialogue this time in Tianjin was quite uh, more concrete now. There's a lot of issues has been raised, a lot of the concrete lists have been proposed. We hope to reduce all those uh, frictions maybe on both sides. One of the things I think probably, uh, you know, really uh, concern on China is this tracing this origin of, uh, of virus. I mean, that is already uh, 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 be, be, be actually uh, criticized during the, when they run the election, the Democrats already said that is really a conspiracy, <laughs> conspiracy because the WHO already sending a, a delegation, went to China, Wuhan, went to the lab, and they come with a, a, a suggestion that least possible uh, to have this kind of, a, uh, you know, this is man-made virus. So, so, you know, issues like that. I mean, to have an FBI or CIA to, to make a conclusion on that is really uh, something I think probably we should, uh, uh, you know, not to, uh, to really 
uh, emphasize too much on that because uh, it's it's going to divide the uh, I think the current uh, uh, you know efforts to to really trying to get a dialogue on. So I don't know if, if you have anything on that. Uh, I mean, this, this virus issue is really getting <laughs> getting a little hot on the, on the Biden administration. I agree with you. Everything other you know, Biden is doing uh, is, uh, is, is, you know, on, there's a, a host of minister dialogues between USTR, between the trade minister, uh, commerce minister, which is great. But, uh, you know, this, this uh, issue, statement of uh, virus uh, sourcing <laughs> Uh, tracing the origin is really not uh, not a, a, a practical idea. I, I don't know if you have any comments on that, uh, Ambassador Wall. A very brief comment. Uh, this, in particular, is an issue on which we should be cooperating and not fighting each other. Uh, I think it is important to trace the origins of the virus, and we have our own views about how that should be pursued. Uh, but the basic point is pandemics threaten every country in the world. And if the two leading countries in the world are unable to cooperate in dealing with a common threat, then there's something wrong with both of us. And we need to consider what the problem is that is preventing us from cooperating uh, uh, on this very vital issue. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I agree with you. I think that is really the key issue. We, U.S. and China, should really now, with the mutant of the of this virus, we should really work together to to fight that. You know, this this morning we had the, in the conference we had the 15 ambassadors uh, from you know old old countries, Europe, uh, Asia, Latin American, uh, uh, and 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 also we had the U.S. Uh, uh, minister council attending the conference this morning as well. You know, that, that is really, uh, you know, they all agree that the, the whole world should act together. We should, you know, making the mobility of the people around the world and have the vaccine passport or certification and find out the ways how we can really make the economic goes around uh, uh, movement rather than we focus on those tiny, uh, not tiny, but, you know, these non-urgent issues because virus happened actually before uh, also uh, in some cases, uh, uh, maybe even before Wuhan, but but let's let's do it. You know, if we do it, we do it systematically. Maybe what we really contain about rather than pinpoint on that as well. Oh, no, uh, I think that's probably what we can uh, talk later. But uh, again, I, I hope we're not uh, you know getting into that too much. But I, I'd like to invite um, Minister Zhu now. Maybe you know after here two think tank uh, uh, leaders from the U.S. Uh, uh, you are uh, you know CCG advisor and also you. You are also working the think tank of the Minister of Finance. Uh, so uh, you, have, you attended our conference this morning and uh, <laughs> speaking with other uh, Chinese business uh, leaders and the government officials, also former Minister of, uh, uh, of Trade, uh, Minister Chen Deming also spoke, Vice Minister Chen Jian of Commerce also spoke, and also a host of other international experts. So what's your take about this? Uh, uh, U.S.-China relations says you've been really uh, working on this for, uh, uh, you know, for a long time and really a top expert in China on the subject because you really led the strategic uh, and economic dialogue. You, you, you were the shepherd of G20. Uh, so what's your take on that? Thank you very much. It's my honor to join this uh, distinguished panel, particularly after the President Paulson and uh, Ambassador Roy speech. I think I, I just try my best to directly discuss and uh, some response for Adam side and uh, Ambassador Roy side. Firstly, from the trace origin of virus, I remember in April last year, I had this phone call with Adam regarding how about the China-US cooperation to deal with the challenge of pandemic. That time, Adam suggests the two great countries must be cooperate, must enhance the transparency and uh, must uh, together within the WHO. That time, US administration, you know, that's the attitude to WHO, but Adam, from that time, firmly support WHO plays a leading role 
and uh, emphasize the importance of cooperation between China and the US to deal with the challenge of pandemic. And uh, I remember very clearly, he also suggested us to pay attention to the situation development, even after China control the situation well, the global situation may be continue deteriorate. And uh, he point three I issue. India, Iran, and uh, Indonesia. He suggests us to think about if there's a deteriorated situation continually in the world, and uh, particularly three I country is a very difficult. Unfortunately, what Adam said that time, that's become the reality. Until today, the world still in the very difficult pandemic situation. And uh, this is not just a public health risk. It's already become systematic risk in the whole world. Economically, governance is also deeply be impacted and uh, really need China, US as uh, two important uh, economies cooperate together. But unfortunately, just as uh, President Paulson and uh, Ambassador Roy said, that's uh, China, US relation now is really in the critical juncture. I think that's the big issue is the less trust each other. And uh, I think that's the person side, so something beyond the economy. That's indeed, that's the situation. But there's two important country. We must uh, keep communication and uh, greatly increase understanding each other and uh, try our best restore the trust. I know this is not easy to do, but I still think economic relation is anchor for our relations. Last year, China-US trade volume 580 billion. Fourth half of this year, that's increased more than 50%. That's the total amount for the six months of this year, US-China trade already 340 billion. So big pressure politically and uh, other negative impact, including both sides public opinion negative. And uh, we see the trade still increase. That's a good thing. That's why that's a good thing. That's, I think that's a very deeply integrated economy made our interest is so close connect. But we should be post, Adam Paulson agree with him. That's a trade war, tariff to technology war. That's a very negative impact. How we restore that's a basic communication now is really important. Just the, now, Ambassador Roy mentioned the Biden administration team is professional. I agree with that. I deal with many officials now in this team. I understood they are indeed professional. But I must point out some key issue Biden administration should correct immediately since that is within US interest, including tariff. And uh, just as uh, Secretary Yellen said, that's not US interest. That's the damage, the benefit of US consumers. But uh, until now, six months pass and uh, no any single change. And very key issue beyond tariff economic side, I think the political side, the ambassador Roy mentioned the genocide issue. That's absolutely wrong. The judgment made by last administration within last two weeks in position. 
and uh, they use this as a reason block import of cotton and uh, tomato produced in Xinjiang. Unfortunately, Secretary of Biden, Administrative Secretary of State, that still conform that previous policy and uh, continually to blame the Xinjiang in genocide to Xinjiang, to Uyghurs. That's absolutely wrong. And that's absolutely that's dangerous for China-US relation. And uh, if that's talk about just as the uh, ambassador, uh, ambassador Roy said, that's his word is unprecedented risk. I think this one is that's real cause to result in the conflict because we never think we take action to against the terrorists and against international terrorists to, to be the genocide. So this one, we must be use public and uh, private conversation communication to solve. And uh, that's why China welcome the the foreigners to visit Xinjiang, and I know that the foreigners they say they want very freely uh, visit. So that's that's a debate. We should have real professional way to solve this problem. I think that these obstacles we must overcome. We must find real fact to solve this problem. This very key for Chinese principles. I uh, just one case. And uh, I do think such as communication, both I see very clearly to the point on the table is very useful. As uh, Adam suggests, uh, he suggested three, that's the point. I think that's, uh, uh, that's very, very important. One Adam said uh, something beyond e economic situation, yes. We should have the more comprehensive discussion. And uh, for this one, we should find a way how to expand our discussion beyond economic. Also, I think that everything will connect with economic relations because our entrepreneurs need this good environment for their investment in China or Chinese enterprise investment in US. We, we should find the way. And the second climate change certainly become that's the real the way for cooperation, including ESG. That's I think this already beyond the pure climate change issue, and that's more broad, more comprehensive. And uh, think tank certainly is that's the real channel for our cooperation. In this regard, I think as maybe very quickly four points suggestion. One is we China US must find the way to deal with each other's challenge and uh, to develop peaceful coexist and uh, based on communication, based on understanding each other and uh, enhance our cooperation to the peaceful coexist. Second, we must keep open and uh, reform both China and the US. China is more depending structure reform, more open to the outside world. That's our domestic interest force. And also in line with global cooperation. This one, we have many, many ways, many, many things can be discussed. Third point is uh, we must have real cooperation a multilateral system. Trade, financial, WHO, WHO, IMF, World Bank, and uh, other UN special agencies. And this global network that uh, need our cooperation to maintain it, to improve it, to enhance it and make that the, the world is in peace and 
development. The last one, certainly, I suggest we keep this real dialogue, communication, and we need real methods such as SED, such as the BIT in Obama administration, we negotiate. I joined that deeply. I know near 90% of BIT we need we finished. That's last very important issue we not solved is the digital economy issue related. That's the data flow cross board, data privacy issue. That's today become more important. And uh, now every country, including US, China, EU, and others, to emphasize domestically how important to develop of digital economy to enhance the security of uh, cyber system and enhance uh, the privacy. And those all need this global coordination, global negotiation, maybe one Break point possible is e commerce negotiation in WTO. I know that's still very difficult. We should try. And uh, that's for the future growth. And uh, that's a real need for our cooperation between China and US. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Zhu. I think you have raised many uh, uh, good points as well. And uh, uh, one of the particular points I, I really uh, uh, strongly agree with you, I, th I think there's quite a bit of uh, uh, probably uh, misunderstanding on, on the issues in Xinjiang. And of course, China uh, uh, has in the past, has no experience dealing with terrorism. There could be uh, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, the way they handle, you know, needs to be improved, but, but definitely it's far from genocide. I think, you know, that uh, uh, Pompeo has actually think about that term. And then while Blinken get uh, testified that the, uh, the senator, he 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 wanted to get the past, and he probably get go, went along with what Pompeo suggested. But then they don't have to own it. I think that the Xinjiang now is really open. I mean, all the foreigners can go there. I, I recently we we talked to some uh, China, uh, China uh, uh, foreign embassy officials actually uh, in the conference. They had to, you know, the ambassador didn't go, but the embassy staff did send people there. They all come back with their own report. I mean, it's obvious. There's there's nothing. Uh, like said, as, as a genocide happened. So any foreigners that go to Xinjiang, there's no special, there's no restriction, just buy your ticket and you can go. So, uh, and see whatever you like to see. So, so I think that that issue has to be sorted out so that we can reduce the tension. Uh, uh, and also seeking more uh, uh, collaboration as the Minister Drew mentioned about this it's BIT, if it's 90% concluded, why can't we continue this 10%? Because data uh, and issues like that after several years, six years now, uh, from the uh, uh, Obama administration, we have a lot of uh, uh, new progress now. China is, uh, is a big data uh, uh, country, and he realized data is oil. If you don't flow, there's no wealth in being created. So many, many channels, like uh, China recently agreed to join this uh, OECD G7 unit, propose of a minimum uh, global corporate tax, which is a good example how we can avoid these uh, loopholes and uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that really, uh, you know, the money can really benefit uh, both the host and, and home country. And, and also we can talk about WTO, as Minister Drew said, and also uh, CPTPP, as uh, uh, Biden, Obama administration, which concluded. Uh, China announced they're going to join in, and Minister Commerce has put TPP agreement on the Minister of uh, Commerce website. So that's the standard, that's the target, that's, that's where we should aim for. So, I mean, China is not, not uh, afraid of uh, talking to this point, but I, I, I hope that we have more channels to talk, including WTO, so that we can do that. Uh, but now I really would like to invite our very senior uh, uh, our panelist, <laughs> also very, very uh, 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 highly influential. I mean, uh, uh, John, you you are uh, the honorary chair for for Brookings for a long time. I know that uh, uh, Brookings even set up a China Center called your name, <laughs> John Center China Center, and of course you are. Uh, 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 you know, that has already been over 10 years uh, during my days at Booking, you, you already, uh, and that, that is already called John Santan Center and uh, China Center. But also now you, you are the co-chair of Asia Society. Mm -hmm. Asia Society is a very uh, influential uh, uh, bridges between China and the US. 
And uh, so you're on top of that. And uh, uh, even more so, you, you are very familiar with China. You are the first probably uh, American uh, uh, to be a, a, a professor at the Tsinghua Man Economic Management School. So, you know, we have been talking so far, uh, your wisdom, your, your suggestion is absolutely uh, highly expected because I remember uh, last year during the same conference at the CCG Annual Forum, you, you spoke with us uh, last year, talk about this deficit of trust, how to build up the trust. Now, half year uh, into the new administration, uh, what, what more can be done? I mean, you know, we are all years and we love to hear from you. So John, you have the floor, please. Okay, thank you, Henry. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this very interesting and important dialogue. And I'm honored to be a member of this particular panel. We've already heard quite a bit of wisdom from my three colleagues, and I will try to make a modest contribution to that. So what I'd like to do is step back from the breathless statements of doom, which dominate much of the immediate commentary in the media, among politicians, and among so-called experts, or even the thoughtful observations of concern, which may be overly influenced by specific current actions by one party or the other. The US-China relationship is and will be both the most important bilateral relationship of this century and the one which will drive or create in large measure the world in which we all will live. In general, I am skeptical of grand sweeping statements about inflection points or decoupling or Cold War analogies. For me, these kinds of statements are mostly emotional provocative, not helpful, and wrong. I think we are better off looking at the long-term, the trajectory of the dynamics, trends, and forces creating that long-term. Recently, I have taken to looking at the mid 21st century, the year 2050 or thereabouts. The best estimates are that the world's population in 2050 will be about 10 billion people. Today, we are approximately 7.8 billion. The incremental 2.2 billion, more than half of them will come from nine countries. India, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Tanzania, the United States, Uganda, and Indonesia. In 2050, as now, a small percentage of the world's countries will represent 65 to 70% of the global GDP. Maybe, maybe the top 10 countries will represent that. In that world in which very few countries dominate the global GDP and in which the incremental two, two plus billion people are coming from very poor countries, in that world, does any serious thinking person believe the world would be better off with the rich countries primarily arguing or even fighting amongst themselves while the rest of the vast percentage of the world remains poor, malnourished, victims of climate change, sources of migration and disease and poverty? Or do the wealthy, most powerful countries have a responsibility to work together to lead the world to a safer, more prosperous, harmonious place? Isn't the answer obvious? If the answer is so obvious, then why does it feel or seem that at least some, maybe many of the world's richest, most powerful countries do not seem to be animated or motivated by such a collective goal? There are a myriad of answers to this question, but it certainly includes a penchant for being captured or trapped by the past and old thinking, as well as a fear of change of losing, losing one's place. Whatever the reasons, surely the world's two most powerful countries, the US and China, have a disproportionate responsibility to lead the world, of course, with others. And there is no reason why they cannot do this. 
In fact, we have a unique asset at this very moment in history, which we have never had before, an extraordinarily powerful asset. The newly elected US President Joe Biden has a pre-existing relationship with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. When Presidents Biden and Xi were vice presidents of their countries, they spent extensive, continuous, informal time with one another. Probably more genuine private time than any two US and Chinese presidents have ever spent with one another. This is a gift from Providence. We cannot throw this asset away. Indeed, we must use it to its fullest extent. Knowing the two presidents, Biden and Xi, as people, as human beings, as leaders, does anyone think that a well-conceived meeting, one-on-one -on -one, between the two of them would be anything other than a strong, good, healthy, warm, productive meeting? And knowing what we know about the two countries and their positions in the world, does anyone think such a good meeting would not be well received by the American and Chinese people or by people all over the world? Of course it would. This is not that difficult. And there is a screamingly obvious place to start. Climate change and the G20 meeting in Glasgow. The issue of climate is a global one. It is larger and more important than the US and China. The entire thinking world wants it to be solved or well managed. The two leading countries must lead on the solution or it will not be solved. Everyone knows this. Tellingly, the two presidents are following the only path, the only modus operandi that works in US-China relations. One might call this the Zhou and Lai Kissinger model, or more recently, the Liu He Lighthizer model. The only model that we know works is when the US and Chinese presidents appoint a very senior, serious, experienced, highly trusted individual. And together, the two presidents instruct the two people to get into a metaphysical room truly work together, build a relationship of trust, and do not come out until they have solved the problem. The two presidents have done just that with the appointments of John Kerry and Xi Jinping. Meanwhile, it would be helpful while the two are doing their work if the two sides moderated their language about all other matters, or as State said, toned down the rhetoric. No other matter by definition is as important as the existence of the planet. Mankind has to exist for all other matters to have an opportunity to flourish and or be addressed. This is a point of simple, compelling priority. Both presidents have publicly said that they will cooperate on climate irrespective of other issues. Both should instruct their senior leaders to give the existential issue a real chance to get resolved. Finally, to state the obvious, success on climate will demonstrate yet again that the US and China working together can lead the world to a better, safer, healthier, more harmonious existence. This is good for both countries and the world and gives hope and a concrete model that all other gnarly complex problems can likewise be addressed by the two leading countries working together with others for the collective benefit of their countries, their peoples, and the world. Thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, uh, you have an uh, uh, like, uh, excellent uh, uh, proposal. I think you have uh, really uh, uh, got very deep on that. Uh, I agree that you said that this is this is a most important relation between China and U.S. And of course, uh, we can work on many issues. Given the the world is really having a profound changes now, as you outlined, you know, we're going to uh, you know have the population hit uh, 10 billion by 2050. Uh, we need really a, a long a long uh, uh, horizon, looking at a long longer views uh, historically. 
when I had a, a, a dialogue with Joseph Nye, he also talked about, you know, by 2035 or even longer, maybe China and US will react to each other differently, less hostile than today, because, <laughs> because we're having the world in mind, probably is making a huge difference. Like climate change, we're having these uh, uh, floods in Europe, floods in China, in Hernan, and, and uh, you know, uh, wildfire in, in North America and things like that. We really need to uh, contain that. And uh, I, I, I think the, the brilliant idea you talk about, since uh, President Biden, President Xi has a, such a, a great uh, personal rapport, you know, they really should appoint uh, uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, special uh, envoy. And, and, you know, like, like we saw in this dialogue, uh, uh, as you call it, the Kissinger John Line model, I, I think that is a great model, or, or Lighthizer uh, uh, Liu He model. So I agree, uh, that's really great. I may have a follow-up question because uh, you know since you are uh, in the investment community, you've been uh, you know leading the Goldman Sachs for so many years. Uh, I mean, the world is really need a lot of uh, help. I mean, you said uh, nine countries that are uh, going to be populated populous in the in the next uh, uh, several decades. Uh, so, so the infrastructure seems to be the lacking uh, uh, in, in many other developing countries. Uh, as a matter of fact, at uh, today's uh, 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 you know, CCG annual conference, uh, former Vice Minister uh, Chen Jian of the Commerce, he looked after China outbound investment for many years. He actually said, you know, like uh, what has been proposed at the G7 about this, uh, 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 this B3W could be maybe looked at together with China's uh, you know, BRI and other EU uh, uh, investment plan. The world should work together with uh, some kind of infrastructure uh, uh, plan to uh, to look at the, at the future, uh, particularly for the developing countries. As a matter of fact, uh, when President uh, Xi had a telephone call, uh, a video conference with uh, 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 President Macron and uh, Angela Merkel, German Chancellor, just uh, uh, two, two or three weeks ago, they talk about uh, China EU collaboration in Africa. So, so what do you think? You know, we we need some. Uh, things that are glue all those countries together to work on better objective rather than we're you know really obsessed with this uh, 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 you know source of origin of virus and those <laughs> non-urgent issues so so what, what do you think uh john please well for, first of all i want to remind people that the uh, bri when it was first conceived back in 2013 uh, there was a G20 meeting and President Xi uh, met with a very senior American who was, who was standing in for President Obama because President Obama was not present. And in that meeting, President Xi told the Americans of the uh, concept he had about the BRI. And the senior American said to President Xi, what a, what a fantastic idea. Maybe we could do this together. And President Xi said, that would be an excellent idea. Let's do it together. And uh, the senior American went back to the United States. And lo and behold, in the next six or nine months or so, the uh, let's call them the, uh, the Mandarin technicians decided it wasn't a good idea. And the idea got killed in the US before it ever got to President Obama's desk. And so the cooperation never occurred. And since then, as you know, the BRI has been characterized by many people in the United States as some kind of uh, sort of nefarious geostrategic plan to take, to take over the world, uh, which it never was conceived as and, and is not. Um, now, to your direct question, of course, the uh, Build Back Better and the BRI, all those efforts should be coordinated globally by the wealthy countries trying to build the infrastructure necessary for the rest of the world so that we build a safer, more prosperous world. And we all know these kinds of projects are very difficult to execute. It's not as though anyone's got a monopoly on how to do this well. They're hard. And uh, we'd, be, we'd, we'd be doing ourselves a great service if we, we the world, became particularly expert at uh, building important infrastructure all over the world in an, in an efficient manner for the benefit of the respective countries in the world. So yeah, it's a perfectly obvious that we should be doing. There's no, doubt, there's no question about that. Thank you. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Actually, I heard the same story where last, 
Last year in February, the Munich Security Conference, uh, CCG uh, hosted a round table. We had uh, the former Secretary of State, John Kerry, uh, as a, uh, a speaker there. And he actually mentioned that when he met President Xi, he was uh, talking, uh, inviting China to, to, to join the Paris Accord. And uh, President Xi also mentioned that you uh, invited the US to join Belt and Road. I mean, at that time, John told me that it was really a positive concern, but as you said, the Mandarin somehow lost that into the system, in the system that, <laughs> that never materialized. But I think it's time that uh, for the next seven, several decades, maybe China, US, EU, and Japan, and all those countries could, can work together for the infrastructure revolution uh, that has really transformed China, for example. And also China's built is AIB, and also US was invited, somehow uh, was lost it. Now the AIB has 104 country members, including all the European uh, countries almost, and uh, ex just excluding Japan and, and the US. So I hope that maybe we could uh, upgrade uh, AIB to GIB, to Global Infrastructure Investment Bank, and let US, China, uh, and the EU work together on that. So, so, so thank you for your, for your open mind on that. Uh, so we had a first round, and now I want to come back uh, to uh, our, our other uh, distinguished panelists. I mean, I mean, Adam, I know Peterson Institute has been studying uh, TPP for so many years. You were proposing a lot very well. And uh, so TPP in China, uh, when President uh, 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 Trump uh, withdrew from TPP, CCG is the first think tank in China proposed that China should join TPP. Uh, we actually issued several reports on that. We've been uh, constantly uh, advocate for that. And finally, uh, Premier Li mentioned that last year at the National People's Congress, China is interested. China, President Xi announced that at the APEC, uh, that China is interested in, in, the, in to, uh, join the TPP. And Minister of Commerce now put the TPP agreements on the Minister of Commerce website to show that here are the standards, you know, um, on, on all those issues. So since Peterson is a great uh, think tank on the, on the economic uh, issues, particularly you've been studying this uh, uh, TPP for many years. I know that you have many scholars doing that. So what's your take on those issues? If we can talk, you know, under some kind of uh, uh, issues, because TPP involves, uh, you know, data flow, like uh, what uh, Minister Zhu said, used to be an optical uh, obstacle, you know, and also uh, IPR protection, environment uh, protection, labor standards, or uh, SOE reform, uh, competitive neutrality. Maybe, you know, we could talk about that. Uh, like uh, John said, we should have a two sides. Talk about that. And the U.S. designed the TPP, and why not uh, U.S. come back to TPP and China comes together and let's talk about all those uh, 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 urgent issues so that we can have a, you know, push the reform of the WTO you know, by those regional integration uh, experiment that we already have on the RCEP, on the TPP, and and others as well. So Adam, your your, your take, please. Thank you, Henry. Um... So let me pick up on what you were just saying and what my friend Guangyao, Minister Zhu, was saying about reform. The most important thing about CPTPP, um, especially as it, it has evolved since President Trump withdrew, is that it is an incredibly high standard agreement and it is an incredibly open agreement. In other words, when we Peterson Institute, as you say, has been proudly doing work on economic agreements on free trade areas, particularly in Asia, uh, for decades. And long ago, there was a debate between my predecessor, Fred Bergsten, and the distinguished Columbia economist, Jagdish Bhagwati, about stump trade blocks, stumbling blocks versus building blocks. And the, the basic message that we took that I, I've altered slightly is that you can have regional agreements be useful if they genuinely open things up and if they genuinely encourage reform and high standards in the countries that are members. And if you are not biasing them by uh, political factors. And so I'm gonna go out on a bit of an unusual limb here and say in this, for the time being, it would be good if CPTPP continues to succeed and grow without either China or the US being involved. I think in the current context where a number of people in both Chinese and American governments are looking to line up 
various developing countries around the world, including but not solely in East, East and South Asia, as being on one side or the other. Um, and this relates to what Professor Thornton was saying about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and how that goes. Um, I, I think it was very good to have a live, high standard, open entity that is neither Chinese nor the US and that offers a way forward without asking people to commit to one side or another in some sense. And we can see this in the extension of CPTPP potentially to the UK and to Korea. In both cases, this would send an important message to the rest of the world that you can have high standard commerce on the issues you raised, including labor rights, environmental standards, data privacy, state subsidies, and so on. All the things that the Obama administration and former USTR Mike Froman, but also importantly, the Japanese, Singaporean, Australian, New Zealand governments argued for and have that be a standard that then puts pressure on both the US and China to raise their own games. And this, I think it goes with something I wrote, I guess almost a year ago now, where I encouraged the Australians and the Japanese to pursue what I call principled plurilateralism. That is that they should be willing to engage in these plurilateral deals but they have to be based on quality and standard. And I think this will disappoint some people in both Beijing and Washington, particularly in Washington, where the arguments for CPTPP initially and the claims to bring it back to Washington are all about aligning the trading system against China um, or having a block that puts pressure on China, but by pressure on China by exclusion. I also think that it's preferable to go this route um, by having uh, a, a independent, strong CPTPP that's not dominated by China or US, because frankly, we know that once trade agreements are made, you have issues of enforcement. And China and the US would probably make as conditions of their accession um, changes to the TPP or changes to enforce it. It will not be entirely reliable. We've seen this in the way the U.S. has repeatedly renegotiated USMCA and Korea-U.S. trade agreement. We've seen this in other ways in China's deals. And whereas if we keep it open to everyone but China and the U.S. without saying so, CPTPP is big enough that anybody who accedes, including, say, Korea or the U.K., would have to accede, would have to be an accession country. Now, my friend Guang Yao mentions the importance of multilateral institutions and um, obviously the WTO is, is lurking in the background here. I think there are completely ways of keeping this compatible with the WTO, but the kind of plurilateral deals are ne of the willing are necessary to keep moving reform forward. We cannot have India and Brazil you know, blocking all progress on trade. The final point, sorry, I should put in one footnote, and one final point. Thank you for your indulgence. The footnote is, this is my own view. Uh, we are a center of work on CPTPP and on trade integration in Asia. Um, my colleague Jeff Schott recently wrote telling Japan that they need to get the U.S. back into CPTPP. So this is not a, a Peterson Institute position. This is my own. Close footnote. The final point I would make is in light of Guang Yao's rightly raising and, and Stape and everybody rightly raising that the pandemic response is far more important than the other things that we talked about. And I chose not to talk about that because Henry, I was trying to be responsive directly to your question. And I, okay. I, I don't want to give the impression I, I've changed my mind since okay. Mr. Zhu and I spoke a year and a half ago. It's, this is still the critical thing. But what that means is, as seen in the latest IMF release, which came out, I think, overnight, that the world is incredibly divided with the poor countries being excluded from vaccine distribution 
and likely to have very long lasting suffering economically and socially, as you said, I think, or it was you or John said, said rightly, this isn't just about public health. This has implications that are much more long lasting. I think a China and or US included CPTPP would reinforce the message that the rich countries or the, the countries already integrated can get on with their business and ignore what happens in the rest of the world. And that message is already coming through much too strongly on the vaccination and aid front. And so at this time, I would much rather see China and the US put their efforts into being helpful there than into CPTPP. I want Japan, Australia, Singapore, Canada, you know, all the members of CPTPP to move forward, but not China, US. Good. So, so, which I think you mean that uh, let CPP run for a while. I mean, <laughs> let, let us really experiment on that. But what about the WTO? I mean, that uh, the minister uh, meeting of WTO is coming up uh, this year. And uh, uh, we have already the new uh, DJ being approved by the US as running office already quite a few months. So what do you think of the prospect of a WTO reform? We have those polylateral meetings on digital economy, um, on trade deliberation and the facilitations and investment facilitation as well. And uh, so, so, so what about that? It seems that now uh, quickly uh, G7, uh, US and OECD proposed this uh, corporate minimum tax uh, uh, internationally. China joined that, 130 countries agree with that. So, so anything we can really you know, talk on each other and agree on and G20 can really uh, you know, turn the efforts of fighting pandemic also addressing those economic issues. Yeah, I, so just quickly, I, I think on the WTO, you know, the, uh, as again, with so many things, the rhetoric has outstripped the reality. All the talk about WTO reform and WTO dysfunction, especially in Washington, is exaggerated and unjustified. I think the frustrations with the trade rounds, the large scale trade rounds are real and there are some tweaks to be had to the, to the appellate body. But the new, um, the new Director General Ngozi Okonwa, Okanyo Igawala, who I admire greatly, I think has come in with the right attitude, which is don't try to fix everything at once, don't get caught up in procedures, try to get deliverables, show the world that the WTO can deliver things that matter to people. And so she is rightly focusing on trade issues having to deal with the pandemic, with fisheries, um, with direct limited appellate body reforms. I think this is the right way to go. It does, there are too many things. You just rattled off a huge list, Henry. There are too many things to be done. What's important is that the WTO leadership gets the membership in time for the end of this year's ministerial to make meaningful progress on two or three of these issues, one of which is pandemic. And otherwise it doesn't matter which of the issues. You just need to demonstrate that the WTO can do something useful. And I think if we go off onto too many directions at once, it's not gonna be helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you had, you had raised a second point. I'm happy to yield my time to others, but you had raised a second point. I'm sorry, what, what was- no, the, the, the minimum corporate tax. Uh, oh, minimum corporate tax, yeah. No, it was a wonderful thing to see um, China as well as other major economies agree on this. Um, I think it is critically important for the legitimacy of, of taxation in all societies, as well as providing revenues on a stable basis for all societies that we get the international corporations, notably, but not solely the US digital giants under this regime and not having base erosion and profit shifting. And again, uh, Minister Zhu was involved in the first rounds of those discussions and I praise him and I praise Secretary Yellen for leading this. My fear, speaking frankly, is that this may be a League of Nations repeat moment. Uh, John warned us against excessive analogies, so I hope he'll forgive me, but that you have a progressive Democrat in this case, um, American leadership that gets agreement on something at the global level comes back and finds a isolationist Republican US Senate prevents it from being enacted. And then the world has to go forward somehow without the US participating. And, and this I think could be disastrous 
um, if the US Congress does not take up what the US Treasury Secretary rightly negotiated on behalf of the US and the world. The second point is that it's not perfect. Going back to the themes we all hit, this was an OECD agreement because that's where the multinationals are and that's where the expertise was. And, and it makes sense, but as my colleagues, Gary Huffbauer and Simeon Junkoff have written for the Institute, Peterson Institute, the, there are a lot of small countries in the world that are not purely tax havens, that are not Ireland or the Netherlands that are going to be affected by this in the developing world. And again, it's wonderful to see China and US willing to cooperate on something substantive, but there has to be some engagement of the needs of developing countries and small countries. Again, not the tax havens that have made billions over the years, but other countries. So it's not a done deal. But my biggest fear, as I said, is the US creating a, a, a not as important as the League of Nations, but another League of Nations moment of doing the right thing internationally and failing to live, deliver domestically to keep up with it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for, for, for your very, uh, uh, you know, explanatory uh, answers, you know, and that's good to, to uh, to, to understand on both sides, but particularly, I think this uh, uh, this that the G20 proposal, China is uh, is uh, uh, is accepting that is is going along with that. That is really, I think, a good sign that you know that we, if we do sit down and really analyze the international global economic situation, we can uh, collaborate on that. Uh, now, for Ambassador Roy, I mean, you <laughs> you've been seasoned diplomat uh, for for a long time. You 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 you. You were, you, were, you were in China for so many years, even during your childhood time. And uh, I, I still vividly remember a few years back, we were, we were together, went to Dunhuang and uh, visit uh, the, the China. And then we went to US, uh, you, you, your company has visited in uh, Seattle. So it was really good, uh, uh, you know, many uh, hearing of, of your good wisdom. Uh, what I would like to ask is that, uh, you know, US and China, of course, after, uh, four decades of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, engagement. I mean, there's a theory now in the U.S. saying, okay, China, you know, it doesn't converge with us. It didn't become one of us. But you see, China has a 5,000 years history. You probably know uh, very well. And then its civilization, you know, not really interrupted uh, 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 that often. And uh, uh, so, so China really uh, uh, worked on its own model. I attended the, 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 the previous ambassador of the U.S., uh, uh, Terry Bryanston uh, farewell uh, reception, and he actually said at that conf at the reception said uh, the success of China basically he attributes to three factors. Uh, first is uh, hard working diligence. Uh, he felt that people are still working very hard here. Second is the education. Chinese family attaches great importance to the education, and thirdly he was talking about is the family value. China really respect the seniors, respect authorities. And that's how the Chinese system went. So, I mean, you see, uh, the China has its own unique system and uh, uh, fighting virus, I mean, that system seems to have some uh, advantage. Uh, it doesn't have to be exactly with the US uh, uh, converge. If China can lift 800 million people out of poverty, if China can contribute over a third of uh, global GDP growth, the region, region, you know, as, uh, as time goes on, I mean, we don't have to get into the hideous trap like, like I'm talking to Graham Allison. Uh, that he doesn't agree with that as well. I mean, Joseph and I even said, you know, we should have a longer horizon, maybe look in 2035 uh, during one of our conversation. So what do you think, you know, in the, uh, giving your lifetime experience on China, what's your uh, take on, on the future development between China and the US? I mean, from a former uh, American ambassador to China and a former China hand, of course, still a China hand, <laughs> very high China hand. So uh, ambassador, your, your, your take again, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that is the core issue in the um, bilateral relationship. Uh, I referred in my opening remarks to the fact that the United States was having difficulty adjusting to the need for a new equilibrium uh, in East Asia. And I think uh, that's a real problem for us. Because if you read American speeches and writings on the subject, we still have many people who think that dominance in air and naval power, for example, is necessary for the United States. 
And you can't have a new equilibrium if either China or the United States are setting dominance as a goal because the other side will not accept it. And therefore, if we're going to have a dialogue with China, we have to begin addressing the question of how do we strike a military balance in which each country feels it can meet its defense needs, and the United States, that includes the defense needs of our allies, but is not so powerful that we appear to have the capability to engage in aggression against the other side. And we are not yet there, and we are not yet mentally prepared to try to undertake that task, and it is absolutely necessary because you have to have a balance of power in East Asia. And otherwise, we're going to be continually in strategic rivalry with each other. And that's one reason why I think it is absolutely wrong to think that our dominant factor has to be strategic rivalry. Because strategic rivalry always focuses on the military component, and that ends up generating an endless arms race in which resources are diverted away from economic development into military development. Now here, I think the United States has to stop thinking in terms of dominance. And I think the Biden administration was wrong by introducing this concept of dealing with China from a position of strength. Anybody would understand that China would never accept that as a basis for the United States to deal with China. And the same term cropped up during the Cold War when I worked on Soviet affairs. Uh, the Soviets were very sensitive to the idea of the United States dealing with them from a position of strength. But China is making an enormous mistake by not defining its defense needs strictly in terms of China's defense requirements. But now China has linked its defense needs to its international status as a great power. At the 20th, at the 18th Party Congress in, uh, in, in uh, 2012, the first part of the military portion of the work report talked about China needing a powerful military commensurate with its international standing and appropriate for its defense and development needs. And at the 19th Party Congress, China talks about requiring a world-class military power. Well, if China has a world-class military power, when it has no global military responsibilities, China has no allies outside of the, uh, uh, you know, beyond its immediate periphery in which it has to size its military to meet those requirements. So when Americans look at China, we don't see any ceiling on ter terms of where China wants to develop its military power. And in my opinion, China has to rethink how it is talking about its military requirements. Because if every country tries to develop military capabilities in terms of their international status, what size military does Japan need? What size military does India need? Etc. It, it's the wrong way of looking at the issue. Military requirements should be linked to your defense requirements. And the United States and China need to be thinking in terms of, as President Xi himself has said, a Pacific in which China and the United States can both function together. He said the Pacific is large enough for both China and the United States. And Xi Jinping, in his earlier speeches, has specifically referred to the defense dilemma, which is if China has absolute security, its neighbors have no security. And he's used that exact language in his speeches. So he understands the issue that there has to be a limit on China's defense capabilities or its neighbors will all lack security. 
And this is an area where the United States and China, sooner or later, and the sooner the better, need to start engaging in a dialogue to see if there is a possibility for a strategic equilibrium in East Asia that is compatible with the national interests of both sides. And that means that our national interests also have to be defined in a way that doesn't exclude that possibility. So I think there is enormous scope for China and the United States to stop looking at the world in terms of their own domestic driving factors and to understand that they have to look at the external circumstances in the world in an objective way and then formulate foreign policies that are compatible with the international circumstances in which they have to operate and gain the domestic support for that approach. The United States is not yet doing that. For example, if we look at East Asia, where all of the countries of East Asia have more trade with China than with the United States, it is clear that if we ask Asian countries to choose between China and the United States, they are not going to want to do so because they have very important interests with China. And so we have to understand that. And our foreign policy approach to China and the way we talk about China must not be put in ways that require countries to choose between the good United States with our democratic system and the bad China with its authoritarian system. That's the wrong way to formulate our foreign policy concepts. And China, as I've already illustrated, in my judgment, is making the same mistakes. It's talking about needing global military power because of its status as a great power. And when China, going back to the 19th century, talked about the need for China to regain wealth and power, the power was so it would no longer be the subject of aggression by stronger countries. It was a defensive concept, not an aggressive concept. And that has been lost now because China is talking about powerful military are needed because of its international standing. So uh, this is an area where I think both of our countries need to do a lot more serious thinking. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Raw. I, I think you, you illustrated quite well. I think both countries should not really using ideology or, 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 or you know, the, the old mentality to, to you know, measure the 21st century reality. So th absolutely. Uh, that uh, we need a new thinking, a, a new narrative for that. Uh, I, I think, the, uh, you know, the, you're, you're probably, uh, uh, I think, right in, t in terms of talking that, uh, uh, that we should not be the dominant, uh, you know, seeking dominance on each other. That, that's absolutely correct. And China has really uh, also said in many times that historically, China never colonized any place or sent a soldier anywhere. So what actually China is, uh, you know, in, in, in our observation is that when they, uh, build up some military is really, it seems to be the defensive purpose. I mean, you see there's lots of exercise along uh, South China Sea or Taiwan Street and China really probably catch up and defend that. But one fact is that, uh, you know, the, the U.S. military budget is, is, the, is equal to the next 10 country combined. Whereas China uh, building the uh, speed railway, total length of that is equal to the next country combined. So. But your idea is well taken. I think that we should really seek in the peace and understanding. And uh, uh, so, 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 so I think we, we really need a lot of dialogue on that. I agree with you. We need more uh, exchanges and, and, uh, and talking through those issues and let, let's get out, out of the suspicions and mistrust. Now, uh, Minister Chu, I want to turn to you now. You, <laughs> I remember uh, 2016 when we had 100 uh, G20 you were still the coordinator for the uh, G20 and the Minister of Finance. You were actually saying that the BIT almost closed uh, between China and the US. So, so I was watching you at uh, CCTV and you've been uh, taking an interview uh, uh, along the West Lake uh, uh, in Hangzhou. But uh, what, uh, again, another story I heard from you is that uh, when, uh, when the uh, 208 financial crisis happened, uh, you got a call from the U.S. Treasury Office and talking about how about China and U.S. working together to, to really fight in the, uh, this uh, financial crisis. China really immediately uh, launched the $4 trillion uh, RMB uh, uh, 
uh, revival plan and, and things like that, you know, US China really work together to get the crisis passed. So what do you think about current crisis of pandemic, how we can really work together? I mean, you had a lot of experience on that in, in working with US, maybe your, your view on that as well. Minister Chu, you have to open your uh, mic. Microphone, yes. Before I answer your question, I, I just uh, want some response to Ambassador Royce. Uh, the idea regarding the military strategy and the military intention. And to be honest, uh, in the modern history, China suffered a lot of invasion from foreign countries. And the uh, Chinese people very deeply understand that's how suffered by outside press. And that's, uh, I think that's uh, the people's willing China become very strong country. And uh, however, for strategy and the uh, real situation, when China talk about our co-interest, that's the three point. Number one, sovereignty. Number two, territory integration. And uh, number three is developing right. And we hope with that, China can really become the modernized socialist country and uh, with united country and uh, with the country can benefit the people's living standard. I think for Rosemann, we can have very frank communication to deepening understanding. So I think that's uh, between China and the US to really understand each other's intention become very important, particularly at this time. Now, question about who you you raised regarding this 2016 G20 meeting and the BIT between China and the US. Yes, that's indeed, that's under strong leadership by President Xi Jinping and President Obama. Before G20 Hangzhou summit, Chinese team and the US team worked very, very hard. And uh, that time, US team, the leader is uh, Mike Foreman, the trade representative. He did a lot of work, keep the very close communication with the China team, with the Chinese team, uh, nearly every day. And maybe one day, three or four times. And uh, both on very hard work with strong leadership by two presidents. Yes, indeed, that's we can say openly that time to the Chinese media and the foreign media, the treaty between China, US on BIT, the nearly complete 90%. And uh, we also understand some key challenge, digital economy, particularly data privacy, data cross board, more moving. And uh, we just want more hard work can follow Unfortunately, after that, everybody knows that the US administration change and uh, even the abundance of TPP. So that's the delay, the ne continue negotiation. And uh, another case, indeed, that's uh, in 2008. That's, uh, I remember that's October of 2008, that's a deep, the international financial crisis. I really, in the very early morning, 3 a.m., received the phone call from my counterpart in U.S. Treasury. She went immediately around the meeting between Secretary Treasury Hank Paulson with his Chinese counterpart to talk about possible upgrade G20 format from finance minister and the central bank governor to the leaders. Yes, we did that after three, four hours. I think that's 10 a.m. Beijing, 10 a.m. Beijing time. We really had that phone call. And uh, following, you know, that's the real first G20 summit, November in Washington, D.C., the chaired by President Bush and the Chinese president who joined that meeting. That's a very successful meeting and the paved the way for next the G20 meeting in London to build up 
real firewall for IMF, one trillion US dollar be gathered through that meeting to really strong deal with the challenge of international financial crisis. That's real demonstrate how strong position of China US cooperation, how positive impact of that cooperation to the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Minister Zhu. So, so that kind of cooperation in fighting the uh, uh, you know global financial crisis. I mean, we should really draw lessons on that. You know, about twelve years ago, thirty years ago, that we can really uh, using that spirit between China and U.S. to fight the current pandemic as well. So, so uh, you have provided very good examples of how we used to we work together for the sake of the of the global uh, prosperity. Uh, now, you know, my, my staff is telling me there's about half a million people watching us. Uh, online uh, currently in China and elsewhere uh, in, in globally. And uh, so we had a very good uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like to, you know, uh, in this second round of a uh, uh, discussion, uh, uh, ask John to comment, because I know that you've been a professor at the Tsinghua uh, University Economic and Management School uh, for many years. You have taught a lot of Chinese students. You basically, uh, you know, serving as a uh, honor chair for uh, both uh, uh, Brookings Institution for many years over a decade and also now a few years with the Asian uh, uh, mm -hmm. society in the US. You know, you travel frequently. I mean, there's, a, there's an issue about the uh, student exchanges uh, uh, between China and US uh, uh, because I, I know that I heard from the Chinese fair of, of US uh, embassy here, the US embassy now is issuing 1,000 uh, visa a day, and by the time of summer, they're going to issue 200,000 visas uh, for students going to the United States. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, but again, uh, you know, looking at the uh, numbers, there's also, uh, there's refusal uh, rate as well. There's about two or three percent of refusal rate on that. So how do you think about this people-to-people -people exchange, uh, business exchange, you know, tourism, uh, cultural exchange, and of course, uh, uh, think tank exchanges that really uh, during this special time that we can really promote that uh, on both sides and how we can really leave this uh, work out this uh, travel ban because uh, now uh, you know the virus is, uh, is recognized by the WHO but not recognized by US and China on each other not by recognized by EU and China so you know I mean we probably have to live with virus for a long time but then if we don't really have kind of international currency of, of a mobility uh, to, to government work together, we may suffer that. I mean, already uh, you, are, you are the expert on, on so many areas. So uh, I, I also on the other general comments, I'd like to hear you, John, again. Thanks. Thank you. I can be succinct on this point. I think <clears throat> to state the obvious, uh, the ties between the US or the American people and the Chinese people, to me, are absolutely essential to getting the relationship where it needs to be. Uh, and I'm hopeful that the younger people who have a vested interest in the, in the long-term future of, of their countries in the world will be forces for good in the relationship. And one way of thinking about China, for example, you think about the 400 million, roughly 400 million millennials and how they have grown up and how they think about the future and how the Chinese leadership has been and needs to be responsive to that group. And the same thing is true in the United States. Uh, that the ties between those groups are absolutely central to to forward progress. And I'm pleased to see that the Biden administration, this is one area where they are moving quickly to rectify the previous policies of the policy of the previous administration to open back up again to people to people exchange. Uh, we all know that the ties are deep, they're broad, they're state to state, they're universities to universities, they're NGOs to NGOs, they're individuals to individuals. Um, I mean, there just can, it cannot be overstated that the, the sort of societal trust that needs to be built and was, and was being built and can be built uh, 
is probably the single best insurance policy uh, against um, sort of untoward uh, policies on the part of the leadership. I think in some ways, the wisdom or common sense of ordinary people can act as a kind of a break against uh, the occasional unwise policies of the elites. So I'll leave it at that. Good. Okay, I think that uh, we had a, a very good discussion and uh, we also, you know, because we announced that uh, our, our, our webinar uh, that uh, to the public, also we received uh, some questions. I just want to maybe uh, uh, cite a few of them. And uh, so we'll go uh, uh, last round of, uh, 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 you know, concluding remarks. Uh, plus if you could also uh, uh, address some of those questions that we collected uh, uh, beforehand uh, for, for your, for your from the Chinese media, actually. I have a question from uh, China Daily. Uh, it basically, he said the US administration made the rounds pushing for a lack leak hypothesis, uh, while actually the, the device could be uh, happened, uh, not only just China, but elsewhere. Sh uh, and should we pursue uh, this uh, uh, at the same time as all the other sources, or just, just focusing on China? So this is just one question. And then China News Service also uh, have a question uh, that this year marks the 50th anniversary of Dr. Kissinger's visit to China. Uh, and, uh, and also on the, uh, as the July 9 commemoration, Dr. Kissinger mentioned that the US-China relationship is critical today than 1971. So is there any chance that two sides will somehow break the ice again 50 years later? And on the occasion of its 50th anniversary, what's your vision of the future development of China-US relations? Uh, there's another uh, uh, news, uh, question from the Red Star News uh, in China also. He said on the July 28, which is just two days ago, that Qing Gan, the new Chinese ambassador to the United States, arrived in the United States and delivered a speech. He mentioned that 50 years ago, Dr. Kissinger visited China secretly and knocked on the doors of China. The door to sino US relation has been opened and it, will be not, and it will not be closed. What do you think about Ching Gang's remarks on that? And, uh, and also the Beijing news uh, also has a question. Uh, he said that uh, uh, on the eve of China's Lunar New Year, President Xi Jinping uh, and also President Biden had a phone call and, uh, and also US and China had high level talks at Alaska recently in Tianjin. And uh, how would you comment on the, on the future government to government exchanges between China and the US? And uh, uh, so what about the prospect of uh, uh, President Xi and President Biden uh, meeting at the G20 summit? Uh, uh, what do you think about that? Uh, so, 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 uh, so those are the, you know, a few questions we, we, we selected from the uh, from the media that uh, uh, when, when we announced uh, our webinar. So, so maybe we have our final rounds of uh, uh, concluding remarks and uh, maybe you can pick up uh, uh, the question you, 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 you want to address, but also uh, any, any further thoughts on this uh, uh, balancing competition and cooperation because uh, Secretary Blinken said uh, it's a uh, uh, you know, competition, uh, even fierce competition, cooperation, and confrontation. So probably we, we don't need a confrontation. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what's, your, what's your take? Maybe we'll start with Adam again uh, uh, as, as, our, uh, as our goes this uh, third round. Adam, please. Um, it's been such a rich discussion uh, I'm not, and you gave me plenty of opportunity to speak, so I'm not sure I have much to add. All I would say is that as we're trying to balance competition and cooperation, the key point for both countries, or at least both economies, is to allow for some openness and allow the businesses and the people and the scholars to uh, cooperate, even if the governments choose to compete. And we know from history, including the McCarthy era and the parts of the Cold War in the US and obviously from very tragic periods under Mao, that when societies close down, they create their own corruption and their own abuse of power, as well as having obviously economic and human costs. 
So I think this is where the think tanks, to the extent that we are allowed to do so, uh, have to be out there and reminding people that even if the top government officials in Washington and Beijing want to emphasize the competition, that usually gets distorted into abuses of power internally in those countries. And we should be calling people out on that. Good. Ambassador Rowe. I think the visit to Beijing by Dr. Kissinger 50 years ago uh, is well worth commemorating because it illustrates that when national interest is served by cooperation, differences in political and social systems does not have to block that cooperation. The problem with differences in systems, which has become a big issue in the United States in terms of thinking about China, is that at some level it does influence cooperation, but it shouldn't block it if it's in the national interest to cooperate. But the problem is illustrated by our ability to cooperate with Joseph Stalin when we were opposing Hitler, but when Hitler had been defeated, our ability to cooperate with the Soviet Union broke down. So in some ways, that's the type of issue we face with China. There are forces in the United States that want to block our cooperation with China because of the differences in our political systems. And we need to rethink about the Nixon Kissinger opening to China at a time when there couldn't have been bigger differences between our domestic systems. China was in the height of the Cultural Revolution when that, that occurred. Uh, and yet we set that aside because of the importance of cooperating with China against the Soviet threat. And in my judgment, if we look at what the world requires and our responsibilities as great nations, it is clear to me that the lesson of the Kissinger visit to China is when it is necessary to cooperate, to have cooperation between China and the United States, we should not let the differences in our systems block that type of cooperation. And so I think it's a very important visit. Historically, it created the possibilities for the United States and China to create enormous common interests. And those common interests, in my judgment, continue, and we have to find ways to cooperate in promoting them. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Raw. And uh, so, Minister Chu, <laughs> your concluding remarks. Thank you. And uh, today's situation and the relationship between China and the US is some different with that 50 years ago. One very key point is that uh, both Chinese economy and the uh, American economy is so closely connected. Not only every year more than 500 billion trade, also investment and uh, global governance coordination. And uh, however, we also face this new challenge. Both America and uh, China with domestic public openings up for some populism and uh, some different uh, voice. And uh, this time, we really need the strong leadership by two presidents. I think that we must follow the sprint of President Xi, President Biden at the conversation at the eve of Chinese New Year. And uh, just as uh, Ambassador Roy said, we should expand our common ground and uh, make our cooperation with more broadly expansion. And uh, also, as uh, Adam said, the two nations' social society, including the 
academic side and the people to people exchange must be really enhanced to solid our people's base and uh, to make our two great countries can more understand each other, can more cooperate together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Zhu. And uh, uh, now we will have the final words for, for John. <laughs> you, you, I know you, 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 you've been really, uh, you know, said a long time, but I really appreciate your, your final comments as well. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's so much to say. I'll try to be very succinct. Um, you know, one, I, was, I was admiring uh, the efforts on the part of um, Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Elon Musk and others to go to, to, go to space. Yes. And if you want to use one's imagination uh, of being on these spaceships, looking down on the planet, you know when you're, looking, when you're up there looking down, uh, there's, no, there's no difference between people living in China, people living in the United States, people living in Africa. And uh, I think that we, A, need to hold ourselves to a higher standard and B, need to be more conscious of the fact that we live on one planet and the, the issues are only going to get more complicated and more complex as we go forward. And that the, the leading countries, in this case, the two leading countries, the United States and China, which are the two leading countries now and will be for a very long time, they have a very big burden. The burden is they are responsible to lead the world to a safer, better place. And therefore, uh, when we talk about competition and cooperation, I can, I can understand and be, and be comfortable with both those ideas between the countries. When we add this idea of confrontation, to me, that's absolutely out of the question. And we shouldn't even be considering that as a, as a, as a concept. Uh, the world simply can't take it. And we shouldn't waste any time on it. As I said in my earlier comments, you know, should, there, should, the, should the leading countries of the world really be spending their time arguing and or uh, trying to do each other down or should they be spending their time trying to get the world to a better place? To me, this, the answer is very obvious. And the sooner we recognize that, the better. And we have a we're right to demand of our leaders that they get the big things right, as as uh, Nixon and Mao and Kissinger and Joe and I did 50 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, John. I, I think that's an excellent energy that uh, you talk about. Uh, you know, all this uh, uh, recent uh, space uh, exploration and looking down from the Earth, we are really one. You know, <laughs> I mean, I remember the. The 208 Beijing Olympic uh, 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 slogan was uh, one world, one dream. Uh, basically, <laughs> we are really one world. And this year, Olympic in Tokyo, uh, they actually reached the, the motto that uh, the Olympic has it used to be uh, faster, higher, stronger. Now, this year, they added the together. So I think we really uh, you know, agree that we, we are adding a new dimension. So I think tonight, you know, the, the, the dialogue. Uh, between the U.S. and Chinese think tanks uh, at the, our seventh annual uh, CCG conference was really a very vivid, a good example. I think you all had a, shared a very good light, has proposed a very good uh, uh, insights, recommendations, and uh, suggestions. It's really great for the communication dialogue. We really appreciate that. So we had over half a million people listen to you live, and uh, we really we want to uh, go deep on that. We're going to digest that. We covered many ground uh, uh, from economic, uh, uh, social, uh, international relations, uh, geopolitical. I, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, what uh, John just said uh, at the last minute that uh, yes, we can uh, compete. Let's have an Olympic uh, peaceful competition. You know, uh, but, uh, uh, but we, 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 we have a lot of cooperation too. I mean, climate change, you know, minimum tax and uh, 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 all the other uh, issues that uh, uh, nuclear issues of, uh, of North Korea, Iran, Afghanistan, I mean, now is another early, urgent issue now. So I think that the Tianjin uh, high level meeting has covered all this ground. They identified a number of areas to collaborate. Also, how we can revive the world by facilitating the movement of the people, you know, have a, have a global uh, a vaccine passport, 
uh, or, or vaccine uh, or quickly uh, uh, spread that to the developing countries. All those issues, I think we cover that quite well. So uh, uh, I really appreciate all your time. Actually, you stay quite a bit late <laughs> for that already because we have so much a rich topic. I also look forward to continue our uh, conversation like we did with Wills Institute. Uh, in the past, we hope to do that with uh, uh, Peterson Institute and of course, uh, Asia Society, which I'm having another dialogue with Asia Society Vice President Wendy Carter uh, two days from now, and also Asia Society Hong Kong, uh, Chair uh, Ronnie Chen uh, uh, on August the 1st. So we have a lot of exchange on that. Uh, on behalf of uh, uh, CCG, also uh, on behalf of our CCG advisor, Mr. Drew, I want to thank uh, uh, Adam Posen, the president of the Peterson Institute, uh, Steve Roy, uh, the founding director of the Kissinger Institute of Wilson Center, and of course, uh, 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 John uh, Fountain, uh, the uh, honorary chair of uh, Brookings, and also co-chair of Asia Society. Of course, my uh, fellow counselor at the State Council, uh, Minister Zhu Guangyao, and I also thank our audience uh, for watching us live. And uh, we hope that we'll put it on this on, 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 on continuously. We're going to uh, look forward to the future dialogue. So once again, thank all of you, thank our viewers, and we uh, appreciate all your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>